they handed me a copy uh, of the U.S. Constitution, which is what I'm holding there in the picture and, and what I'm holding up right now. And, and they said, just never forget what he died for. And so, this, you know, from the beginning, I'll just mention that that's uh, it's a privilege to serve in, in a nonprofit where I get to keep the oath I took to that U.S. Constitution so many years ago. And in, Uh, so one of the things that people will often say is, you know, thank you for your service. And one of the things I'd like to acknowledge about that statement is, well, I very much appreciate it. The reality is that nothing I ever did in uniform or would ever do could actually make a, a day-to-day, -day, like a, a difference in the day-to-day -day survival uh, of the American people. And that's what we're going to talk about today is a topic that, that will have an impact on the day-to-day -day survival of the American people. Now, when Anna reached out to me, uh, she wanted you know, to have a discussion a little bit about food security, about grid security. And so you know, I want to start by just um, setting the stage. Okay. I don't know if you, can you guys see that the slides have changed? Yeah, yeah. But, you know, if, you, if you can't read the quote there on that slide, it's from Sun Tzu's Art of War. And it acknowledges that the supreme art of war is to subdue your enemy without fighting. Now, in one way, you, you know, you could turn your enemy's military into an organization that was either in, unwilling or, or incapable of fighting you. And that would be one thing that our adversaries are doing right now. Again, a subject for a different presentation. But the fastest way to subdue uh, us without fighting is through taking out our electric, our, our electric grid. And we're going to talk about that momentarily. I'm just going to start a few items on food because it's all connected right uh, when Anna asked me to talk about this topic and mention the interest in food security uh, what I'll do is just is begin with a few statistics if you guys if you can't read the little bullets on the left side of the line the reality is that less than two percent of the American population actually produces the food that the rest of the 98 percent of us consume and many years ago during the Cold War, there was um, a real acknowledgement of the importance of the nation having stockpiles of food. And of course, this was back before even such a small percentage of our population produced food. And so during the Cold War, we had something called civil defense. Uh, we had a strategic national stockpile that included food. There's no longer any food in strategic national stockpiles. FEMA has eight warehouses stationed throughout the United States that do have some amount of meals ready to eat or MREs, but by and large, it comes to the long-term you know, uh, freeze drive through the canneries, for example, that can produce that kind of material, they can mean only about 1% of the U.S. population. And the reality is, again, if you can't see the bullets on the left side of the slot, the average American consumes about five and a half pounds of food per day. So if you extrapolate that over a year, that's about 2,000 pounds of food per year. And when you look at the preparedness of the average American family, uh, they're not very prepared. Uh, the average family makes you know, 1.6 visits to the grocery store every week. Uh, very few families have, you know, been prudent enough to store a, a decent amount of food in their pantry. And so as a nation, both uh, nationally and individually, we're very, very unprepared for any interruption in that food system. Now, our Center for Security Policy produced a report on this last year entitled Food Security is National Security. And you can see that the picture of that report on the right side of the page. And of course, we analyze a whole lot of different elements of food security. When we, we go through and identify lots of different government policies that resulted in less food security. And of course, we have a whole bunch of recommendations on things that can be done to correct it. Is the fact that the food that we consume on average travels about 1,500 miles to get to its, you know, from the point where it was grown to the point where it's consumed. And that entire system that brings it to us is dependent 
all electricity. And so we need to think about, you know, 9-11 more than 20 years ago, this failure of imagination of what the 9-11 Commission called it, and just recognize that our adversaries have not failed to imagine an attack on the UF electric grid. Every one of our adversaries recognize that that is the backbone of the survival of our modern civilization. And to go back to Sun Tzu, it's absolutely the fastest way for them to win without fighting. Uh, at this point, what I'd like to do is, is ask the audience for just a moment. Uh, we're going to show you a short little video. Before I do, um, it's just a little depressing. I don't want you to despair. I want you to think about this quote. If you can't see the quote there on the screen, it's from St. Augustine. And it says that hope has two beautiful daughters. Their names are anger and courage. Anger at the way things are and courage to prove that they do not remain as they are. And so that's a picture right here, my two daughters. Um, that's the way you know, I think about them and my children all the time. So as we, as we play the film, I want you to just remember, as depressing as it is, uh, there are reasons for hope. With that said, let me just, there's a way that you guys could, you guys downloaded the film already? Yes, it should be ready to go here in a second. Okay, so what you're gonna see in just a moment is just a six minute version of the film Grid Down, Power Up, uh, produced by a gentleman named David Tice and narrated by Dennis Quaid. Uh, so for the moment, I'm just gonna stop sharing my screen for a second and see if, if you guys uh, can show that film and then we'll, we'll start back from there. All right, uh, let's see if I can share mine here and hopefully you can at least see it. And I don't need to see it um, as you guys play in some moments there, but we'll get okay. <laughs> how fragile all this is. Wouldn't take much all to throw us right back into barbaric times. All you have to do would be eliminate electricity. On August 14, 2003, a cascade of power failures shuts down electricity in southeast Canada and across eight northeastern states. Cities like New York are brought to a complete standstill. Hundreds of people are trapped in subway tunnels, while the traffic above becomes a nightmare of grid life. In all, 55 million people lost power for up to two days. The main culprit, a sagging high voltage power line in Northern Ohio that brushed up against an overgrown tree. We are in a very dangerous place. I just think this has to be an emergency, an urgent situation. What would the catastrophic consequences be at a human level if you tried to live in the non-electricity world given the way we build our civilization? On any given day, there are thousands of attempts to penetrate the networks that control systems across America's power grid, and the risks are only growing. The real danger is that our infrastructure, in particular our electric power grids, are as vulnerable to cyber attack as the thousands upon thousands of businesses, companies, government agencies that have already been hacked over the last few months. A massive cyber attack in 2015 left a quarter of a million Ukrainians without electricity. Russia hacked into their grid and cut off power. It wiped out data in Ukrainian federal agencies it wiped out the ability for anyone to pull money out of ATMs. It was the first ever automated blackout tool, and a push of a button can, like a machine gun, get all of the circuit breakers at the utility. And that's what happened. You don't build a tool like this just to use it once. You build it as a kind of uh, repeatable attack that you can drop somewhere else and it will cause a blackout again. John Willing was chairman of FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, a small government agency with jurisdiction over the U.S. high-voltage transmission system. Wellinghoff commissioned a study to see if a physical attack on critical
critical transformers could trigger cascading blackouts. It was actually a very shocking result to us that there's a very few number of substations you need to take out uh, in the entire United States to knock out the entire grid. Knock out the entire grid? That's correct. How many would it take to knock out putting the entire country in a blackout? Less than 20. MedCap, California, 2013. Unidentified gunmen using AK-47s attacked some of the giant transformers that funnel power to Silicon Valley. Shortly before 1 a.m., someone cut telephone cables near the substation. About a half hour later, multiple gunmen quickly fired dozens of shots at 17 transformers. The Wall Street Journal reported that one minute before the police arrived, the attackers disappeared into the night. A nuclear explosion in the atmosphere above the United States could unleash a burst of invisible electrical energy that within a fraction of a second could wash over this country and overload all of our most sensitive electronic devices. An EMP pulse is a very dangerous threat. And it's a realistic threat. If you set off a high altitude burst EMP, every light in this hotel is going to go off, every computer is going to go off, every cell phone is going to go off. The power of an EMP is potentially devastating, and it's an open secret among nuclear capable countries. We actually know that the Russians, the Chinese, the Iranians have in their war plans the first strike plan to take out our electrical power system with an EMP attack. It's not speculation. We know that. Lesson to Kim Jong-un of North Korea threatened an EMP attack. Famed insurer Lloyds of London issued a comprehensive report about the risk of a major geomagnetic storm to the world's economy. Lloyds pointed out that a Carrington-level extreme geomagnetic storm is almost inevitable in the future, and also mentioned that the duration of any outage could last up to two years. This threat has now silently grown to where it is perhaps one of the largest natural disaster scenarios that the country could face, that society could face. How we respond to the looming threat facing our grid will ultimately be judged by history. If you are concerned about our electrical power system surviving, you need to let your legislator know how you feel. And if enough people make enough noise, we can get this through. I know we can get this done. We, the people of the United States of America, the greatest country on earth, must demand that we have a reliable and defensible power grid so that our families can continue to thrive. Failure has never been an option. We got this in America. Okay, we just finished the movie. Should we get all the switch back to you? Awesome. Yeah, can you guys hear me? Good deal. Yeah, let me uh, share, let me share the screen again. Let's go back to the slides. Okay, sir. You guys can see the uh, see the screen again, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. So we're going to co cover just a, a little bit. You know, that's obviously just a six-minute little snippet from uh, a video that's about an hour long. So I want to just cover a couple more things that are actually not in the film, just to drive the point home that we're really not prepared. What you see right here on this picture is an extra high voltage transformer. There's only a handful of trailer systems and rail cars in the United States that can actually move an extra high voltage transformer. The one that you see there is that tiny little gray spot uh, in the middle of the, uh, the trailer. That's actually, that photo was taken in the port of Houston in the summer of 2019. And the reason that's been put on that truck is that during the Trump administration, uh, there was, uh, there was some engineers in our Security Bridge Coalition that discovered some extra hardware on a Chinese manufactured transformer. And so this particular transformer was being imported from China. And so the Trump administration seized it 
at the Port of Houston, and then they transported it to Sandia National Laboratory under federal escort. Now, what you see in that quote at the bottom of the page are not my words, but the words of one of the Trump administration's NSC staffers. And it says they found hardware that was put into that that would have the ability for somebody in China to switch it off. Now, the results of the inspection at Sandia are highly classified, but because of this one statement that's been made, we know for a fact that at least that transformer had a hardware backdoor. What that precipitated was an executive order that President Trump passed on May 1st, 2020, entitled Securing the Bulk Power Electric System. You can see highlighted in yellow that President Trump declared a grid security emergency. At the time, we had about 300 Chinese manufactured transformers in the grid, and this executive order was meant to stop the importation of those transformers and begin the process of trying to figure out how exactly to regain control of our supply chain when it comes to the bulk power system. What you'll also notice in red, that red text right there, is that it was suspended on the 20th of January, 2021, the very first hour for the Biden administration. This was one of the very first things that Biden did was to suspend this executive order, and he has never replaced it with anything. And so what that did is it opened the floodgate to importation of more Chinese transformers. We pulled the data about two weeks ago, and the nation now has 449 of these in our grid. Second thing that I'll mention is no matter what we do to deter our human enemies, right, if we can protect our grid against physical sabotage, if we can defend it against things like cyber attack or nuclear electromagnetic pulse, there is no defense against Mother Nature. You cannot deter them. And what you're looking at in this slide are pictures of the end model of that transformer. If you look closely at the image, the top center of that gray box, that's a transformer. I don't know if you guys can see it, but there's a man standing at the bottom of that, right? So this is a gigantic transformer at a substation in New Jersey that serviced a nuclear power plant. The pictures that you see at the bottom are photos of the inside of that transformer, the winding that have to actually be put in place by hand on massive, massive devices. And then you'll see on the top right a picture of the skyline in 1989 during the solar storm. So this was what they call a hydro-Quebec solar storm. So you got a little bit of a sense there on video about the risk of solar weather. This gives you the ability to visualize just what that does for these transformers. Now, back when that was produced, the lead time for these transformers was about 18 months. Most all of them are made overseas. The lead time for these transformers now ranges between four and six years for them to be produced. This is knowledge that the Biden administration has specifically acknowledged. Speaking of the Biden administration um, and this threat of solar weather, again, we cannot defend the sun. We've had the opportunity twice to brief the Secretary of Energy on this particular threat and on just how catastrophically low the standards are for protection against the threat. So what you didn't see in the six-minute film were any of the details about what the federal government has done to establish protection standards, or should I say approved protection standards that are developed by the electric power industry. What I want to show you, and hopefully you guys can see this chart, this uh, little graph on the left side of the slide, this is something that I explained in detail to the Secretary of Energy. So if you recall the story I told just a moment ago about 1989, uh, a massive, or not even a massive, but a, a relatively you know, modern solar storm struck Earth and blacked out Quebec, again, known as the Hydro-Quebec solar storm. That caused the federal government to mandate that the electric power industry create a standard 
or protection against the threat of polar weather. Now, we're not going to get into great detail about the methods by which the federal government gets to these standards, how the utility industry establishes them. But let me just show you visually what the result has been. If you look at that graph on the left-hand side, and you see that little blue icon on the bottom left, that's the benchmark that the industry established for protection against solar weather. And the way that they established that standard was they looked at data from a 40-year period of solar weather in Europe, not in America, during a period when there was almost no solar activity whatsoever. And dishonestly using that data input, they provide an output for the type of standard that they suggested the government approve. And it has benchmarks so that as you move down in latitude from the northern end, you know, latitude down to the southern, it decreases. So in this case, where the Secretary of Energy was sitting in Washington, D.C., the level of protection required is what you see in green on the left, which is essentially not. And that was the how they established the standard. The rest of those, the yellow, the orange, and the red, are what we know from empirical data, actual evidence of previous either storm or nuclear detonations in the atmosphere. And so what I the Secretary, was that with a hundred percent chance that our nation's grid will go up at some point in the future because of this threat, because with certainty we're not defended against it because the standard doesn't require action whatsoever. Now the good news is that there's, and I'm going to play the, in a moment, pictures of technology that exists to protect against this standard, uh, against this threat. And what I pair with the secretary is that the cost of net protection for the entire nation is about four billion, which is one third of one percent of the Biden infrastructure bill. You can see the picture there that she's giving me a thumbs up through her mask in a virtual briefing but we've seen no action whatsoever by the federal government to take this threat seriously. One other piece of data when it comes to the threat of nuclear electromagnetic pulse. What you see right there on the left is a slide from the Department of Homeland Security where they admit that they're going to use the quote best available science use physics and engineering constraints in analysis to avoid overestimation of risk. Now, if you recall what I just explained about bad data in, bad results out, on how the industry produced their solar storm standard and that the government approved, the same exact mechanism was put in place for electromagnetic pulse or nuclear EMP. And what you see on the right is the cover of a report, a report produced by an organization called EPRI, the Electric Power Research Institute. Now, EPRI is, is, is not a bad organization. There's a lot of great people there. Um, it does a lot of good scientific work. But when it came to nuclear EMP, the work that it did was catastrophically and dangerously erroneous. And I want to give you just one data point to think about. If you recall the very first moments of the video you just watched, where it talked about August 14, 2003, this massive blackout in the Northeast that was caused by a, a single tree branch striking the transmission line, and then a cascading failure that blacked out 55 million people, some for up to two weeks. Remember, that was one single point of failure. And I should also mention that the time it took for the industry to establish a standard and for the government to approve it was nine and a half years. Nine and a half years to establish and approve the standard for education management. But if you remember that blackout that was caused by a single tree branch, one data point to think about, this report produced by the industry, by the company, in its comparison, projections of what would happen with a nuclear electromagnetic pulse attack above the same eastern interconnection. What they predicted was a loss of electrical load 
that was only 40% of the load lost during the 2003 blackout caused by a single tree branch. Again, one tree branch, one single point of failure, and they hypothesized that a nuclear blast in the exo-atmosphere that would cause hundreds of thousands of simultaneous points of failure across the grid would result in a blackout and a loss of load only 40% of what a single tree branch lost. So that gives you at least one data point to know uh, how terrible an EMP protection standard will be if the federal government ever gets around to approving one and if the industry informs it. A little good news. So, and some of this good news actually happened not far from where you guys are sitting right now in Alabama. It's a little story if you can see the picture there the top left. That was the very first time that Mr. Trump was ever briefed in the threat of nuclear DMP. And it's a great story. Um, he uh, actually stopped the briefing and just said, hey, how much? How much to pick? You know? And we said, well, look, you know, the, the most vulnerable transformers nationwide, you know, at the time, we, we estimated about $2 billion. We now know, you know, it's, it's more than that. But he said $2 billion. He said, I can do that. Yeah. I'm rich. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, yeah, that's, that would be great. Trump, yeah. And he said, no, look, well, I'm president. I'm going to crack heads together in the government, and we're going to do this. And, and he kept the promise. So the first thing that happened is uh, in 2017, early 2017, the Trump National Security Strategy, it required that electromagnetic spectrum threats uh, would be addressed. And so what that did is it gave to a courageous general officer in the top right picture. That's Lieutenant General Stephen Foss. Lieutenant General Foss at the time was in command of all of the U.S. Air Force's Air Education Training Command, AATC. And he figured at the time, hey, I've got top cover now. I'm going to create a task force, the Electromagnetic Spectrum Defense Task Force, EDTF. And what he did is, is had a couple of, of really important um, conferences where we looked, and he the bottom left picture is, is actually maybe the major uh, and Ambassador Jim Woolsey, the former CIA director, at one of these conferences where we brought the best minds in the nation together to begin an aggressive approach at trying to address the threat of EMP. And that produced two really significant reports. You see images of those right there. But the little miracle story I'll share with you that happened on the second meeting, which was at Maxwell Air Force Base, right there in Alabama, was that if you go back and you remember this slide I just showed you guys on the, on the right, that report right there, you know, by really only a timeline that God could arrange, the day that the industry published that report was the exact day, the first day of our second conference. And so I had the world's foremost expert on EMP gathered in one spot from Montgomery, Montgomery, Alabama at Maxwell Air Force Base. And I was able to grab every single one of them and put them in a roll and print a dozen copies of that report and have them begin going through it. And so one of the probably most important things that this effort did was that it exposed that terrible, terrible deficient report that was manufactured by the industry and that could have almost been adopted by the government. And we're still fighting that to this day. One of the other really significant things that came out of from U.S. Air Force ETF was a pilot project. So it's at the General Foss Station in San Antonio, Texas. And that's where the AETC was headquartered. And so what he did is he promoted the idea of one flight from the country actually getting started protecting not just the military base, but the surrounding civilian critical infrastructure against that threat of electromagnetic flow. And that's exactly what this project is doing today. And so that's just one of the hopeful things. A couple of other things I'll just mention. You know, you saw in the short video, the gentleman on the left right there, Senator Bob Paul. Look, uh, in fact, I think we probably have enough time. I'll hear this one because it's just a great God story. When I first was assigned the duty of running our nationwide security grid coalition, Frank Gaffney, the founder of our nonprofit, said, look, you're going to go to Texas because Texas has its own grid. 
This is like 10 years ago. And I didn't know anybody in Texas, okay? And what I did is I called the, uh, here, I'll stop sharing this screen for a second, because this is a good story, you guys probably want to see me tell it. Y'all see me? Yeah, yes. Well, I, I know I've got to go to Texas, and I've got, I don't know anybody there, right? But I know that there's a new governor that's going to be inaugurated, Governor Greg, Greg Abbott at the time, and I figure anybody who's going to be important in Texas will be in Austin during that inauguration. So I called up, uh, some of you guys may have heard uh, Dr. Peter Vincent Fry, who was the, the chairman of, or I'm sorry, the uh, chief of staff of the Congressional EMP Commission. I called Dr. Fry, I said, hey sir, I need you to come with me to Texas. We're going to go try to find somebody that will draft the threat of EMP. He said, okay, well, you know, what's the plan? Well, Dr. Fry, I don't really know anybody in Texas, but I'm working on it, I'm praying about it, I'm confident that we're going to meet the people we need to. He's like, so you want me to fly to Austin, you don't have a plan. Hey, Dr. Fry, I promise, I've been praying about it, it's going to be all right, right? So then I pick him up at the airport, he gets in the car, what's the plan? I still don't know anybody in Texas, but I've been praying about it. He's, at this point, he's kind of—he's not too—he's not too happy. And so, uh, so we drive to the Capitol, and you know they have the whole inauguration. I'm, I'm, of course, I'm doing everything I can to try to meet people. And he's getting a little bit—he's getting a little pissed at this point. And you know we go into uh, the elevator in the Capitol, and there's one gentleman standing in the elevator. And so we introduce ourselves. He introduces himself and he's like, what are you here for? Well, this may sound crazy, but we're here to talk to anybody who will listen uh, about a threat that most people have never heard of called nuclear electromagnetic pulse. And this gentleman said, you're talking about hemp? I have to electromagnetic pulse, and Dr. Fry's like, it, not, nobody ever says hemp, right? Because that's the actual technical term for it. And he said, well, my name's you know, Senator Bob Paul, I just got elected to office, but it was my job in the 1960s to protect the Minuteman II ICBM against hemp. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, Dr. Fry, like, wait, wait, wait. you were in you know, this project, and you know, this scientist, right? And they're just talking and back and forth all about all the people they know. And Dr. Fry looks back at me. <laughs> I just said, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, so I just want to screen that video. Good story, you can go back to share my screen. Um, because we have reason. Remember, I told you there's reason for hope. Hold on one second. So, what you see in the picture here on the right is so, let me just back up. So, Senator Hall sponsors legislation that is supposed to protect the grid against all hazards, including EMP. And it gets obliterated. And then that cycle happens every single session for the last four sessions. And let me tell you that the creative ways that the electric power industry can influence elected officials to keep legislation, it, it's, it's absolutely, it's a sight to see. It's, an, it's incredible. So you would think like we'd be getting depressed about that, which we do sometimes. But during that process, what happened is that a company in Texas, Centerpoint Energy, the very first session that they saw that they were potentially going to be forced to address this threat, they went out and got their engineers and said, look, we need you to start figuring out how to fix this problem. And so what you see on the picture on the right is something called FIPROTECH. It's a digital protective relay encasement that this will replace, if you ever go by a substation and you see like a 12 or 1600 square foot, what looks like a metal house basically, it's a small building, that's usually there to um, house all of the different protective relays for that substation. What Centerpoint did is they shrunk it down in a digital format and put it in this thing the size of a chest freezer that's completely impervious to EMP. And so that solution can protect against one of the catastrophic parts of EMP, the, e, the E1 part of the pulse. And it wouldn't be here if Senator Hall hadn't sponsored that legislation. The second thing I'll show you is another reason for hope. There's a second part of that pulse, the E3 part. And we didn't get into the great detail about the you know, E1, E2, E3 portions of the pulse. But the phenomenon of solar weather 
is, is really, it produces the same threat as the E3 part of the PMP. It's what they call a ground-induced current, right? So these currents travel through the crust of the earth and electricity wants to take the path of, of least resistance. And so it moves up through electric transmission lines and it'll put these voltages, these voltage buildup, and these, elect, these transmission lines, and it'll fry whatever's on the end of them, which is these you know, gigantic transformers. What you see in this picture here is a proven test solution. It's called a neutral ground line. And the one that you see on the left, that particular picture, that one's been in operation for almost 10 years. Works flawlessly, it's been tested. The one on the right is actually has installed not far from where you, just a little bit north of you guys in the TVA grid. It's a little bit tough to see in the picture, but that substation is put off to off. You guys can see, you know, like the little white trucks in the middle. That solid ground is this tiny little thing over here. That particular transformer right there is a $20 million transformer that would take six years to replace. And it can be catastrophically ruined in the solar weather. They just installed last year that neutral ground blocking device, and it's already activated multiple times with very, very small solar systems. So this is something that the US government, the Department of Energy knows exists. It works, it's been tested by the, by the government, but the government's not requiring it as a solution, but the solution's there. So what does that mean? What do we need to do? Okay, and we're gonna get to the Q and A in just a moment, but what I wanna do is just emphasize how we need to work this from the bottom up, right? So let's just talk, you know, bottom up approach, the individual family. What you see on the right is just a screenshot of the back page of that same report I showed you at the beginning. In the beginning, you know, we talked about food security. That food security report has recommendations for what to do about food security issues at the federal level, at the state level, the local level, and the individual level. At the individual level, uh, we literally have links right there on what you can do to begin to have an impact on your own family's food security, right? We, we're not in the business of, of, we're not professional prepper advisors, right? Uh, but I would tell you that, for, for example, you know, my own family, we have much more than a year for the food. Uh, you know, if I lost my job, I could still at least feed them for a long period of time. Right, because of this, this awareness of the food security issue. So we give you the tools that you need as an individual, as a family, as a community to come well prepared. But one of the things that Dr. Pry told me, remember the gentleman I, I told you the story about, unfortunately he passed away um, about a year and a half. One of the things he says, like, grid topic, it's scary. It, it makes people want to run on it, right? So, you know, if you think about, okay, let me just create some grid down street site that I can go to when the grid goes down, and then you, you end up putting all your focus there. And I'm not telling you not to be prudent and prepared. But what he said with Tommy, he said, people need to know that they couldn't just run to the frontier, that they, the founders of this country had an infinite frontier to run to. But they didn't. They turned and they fought. And so we need to fight the tyranny of inaction. And when it comes to the grid topic, obviously part of it is what you're doing right now, right? You're getting educated on the topic. The film, the little six minute film you saw was the very beginning of a full documentary, Grid Down, Power Up. So one of the things that we help the producer do is to provide a mechanism for people to get involved. So if you were to go right now to griddownpowerup.com, of course you can watch the film, but you'll all see, and hopefully you guys can see it there on the top. There's a spot that says participate. And if you were to click on that participate tab, it gives you the ability to share the film, but to actually send letters to your own officials in your state. And these are letters that we already pre for you. Um, not only the elected officials, but your public service commissions, and even the electric utility in your state. The best of our knowledge in giving the contact info for those people. So you have at, at disposal the ability to educate yourself, educate the people you use with, and through that participate tab, to actually take action and start building that awareness and collecting efficient. So that gets us to the community level. So as you take those steps an individual to share the truth about the threat, 
One of the key audiences that you should have is your emergency managers, law enforcement, those in your community that are gonna really have a difficult time if the lights go out, right? So one of the things that we've begun to work here at the Center for Security Policy is something called the Resilient Communities Network. So I have a network right now, about 250 years ago, law enforcement officers, emergency managers, at the local level across the country that we're communicating to about threats to infrastructure and even ideological threats. Let me give you an example of how that might work, how it did work in one case. So one of the, the people who we've been working with for a long time in our Security Grid Coalition uh, is an emergency manager up in Waldo County, Maine. And so what he began to do was consume a lot of the, the information that we would, would brief and talk about when it came to the grid, and he set out to create an actual off-grid capable emergency operations center. He actually contacted us as well because he got some federal grant money and he wanted to do some law enforcement training. But he contacted us because the threat that he was most worried about were eco-terrorists, anarchists, and Antifa. And he wasn't real confident that the federal government was going to give him the truth about any of the threats. So he said, hey, can I, can I use my grant money to hire you guys to come teach us about these ideological threats? I said, yes and no. No, we can't take your money because we don't take any money from the government, from any foreign sources, or from any industry that could profit off of our recommendations. It is purely for the public interest, and we are purely funded by the American public. So we can't take your money, but yes, we will come train you. So you see the picture there of Kyle Scheidler. That's actually him testifying before the U.S. Senate on Antifa, giving our good some of the good intellectual ammunition to present testimony back on the idea that Antifa is just an idea, right? Um, as we've heard, and so what we were able to do for this particular county was to go in and train its people on the ideological threats facing the community, but then also take from them the progress that they had made on the infrastructure related threats. And so you see that report, the a model of resilience that you can do it right now from our website. And those are the sorts of things that, that the toolkit that we're in the process of creating right now to help make communities more resilient. Uh, I will tell you that uh, to commend your state, we, we have, I will tell you the largest group of law enforcement officers in this network are all from Alabama. Uh, the Police uh, Benevolent Association um, hosted us a couple of years ago to do briefings on Antifa, and so we were able to, uh, to provide that for law officers in your state, and, and we're gonna continue to try to do that uh, as, as introductions. And then finally, the state level. So we talked a little bit about Texas, right? But if you look at the picture at the top right, that's Christopher Holton um, on, on the right side uh, with the, the governor of, of Georgia at the time. This is years ago. Anyway, Chris traveled all over the country working on legislation, a bunch of different threats. Again, ideological threat and infrastructure related threats. One of the successes we recently had was working with a public service commissioner of Louisiana. Every state is different. Some states, the public service commissioner, public utility commissioners, have the authority to be able to direct things as if it were a law. And that's the case in Louisiana. And so Chris helped one of the commissioners in Louisiana to put forth a directive that would prohibit Louisiana utilities from using assets that came from China or other adversary countries to try to you know, take care of this issue of Chinese transformers and other things like that. That was something that could be done at the public service commissioner level. Again, every state's different. At the legislative level, I, I just briefed you guys about you know, Texas. Now you see the picture on the bottom right, uh, that's me testifying before one of the committees in Texas. You'll see I have stacks and stacks of unclassified reports with all the truth about the threat. The lobbyist that's seated to my right, she knew exactly who I was. Uh, <laughs> this is, that's how it works every single time. Those that are representing the industry, um, they're able to usually really sway uh, away from doing anything the industry's not interested in doing. 
But well, we had a break from the Syrians. And that was after the very, very sad and destructive winter storm Yuri. The utility industry knew that they had pressure. There was so much pressure building to solve the problem of winterization that they actually supported a bill that would enable public service commission in Texas to give Texas these what's called cost recovery, essentially financial incentives to increase their resilience. They, they did that not only for cold weather, but for lots of other things like physical sabotage. Now they left out solar weather and EMP, but it was a good step in the right direction. And so I think between what we now see with the Louisiana uh, Public Service Commission directed this bill that passed in Texas that could be slightly amended to add additional threats. We have some examples of things that states could do uh, if you all have people that you know in your legislature. And of course the governor, depending on the authority that a governor has, every, again, every state is different. There are possibly things that a governor could do by executive order. So one of the things that you know, we 